anti-Semitism and fascism ruled in this country, what was prevalent in this country, significant and scary as that, to the extent that we still have British National Party in this country who are racist and who sometimes preach a politics of hate and discrimination and prejudice. You will also notice that the distance that this took place from England is 22 miles. That's the distance from Calais to Dover. This was only happening a very short distance away. The Channel Islands were occupied and English Jews were taken to the camps. Right across Europe there were camps and those are just some of them.
When I was 13, second year, I made loads of mistakes because I always went drinking, fighting, smoking, started smoking, wish I never started smoking now. Just bullying people because I got bullied and then I thought it was funny. Not bully, not bully, bully, but like take the mic out of people and thought it was hard and funny. I got judged all the time by the way, but I just thought it was a just. To be honest, it just thought it was a waste of space. Thought nothing's going to happen. I think, I think a lot of people maybe thought I'd end up an alcoholic or a drug user. So honestly, to be honest with you, because I was the way I was going, just not listening to anyone. Not that I was taking drugs or stuff. Just the way I was acting. There was no hope. Just well, there's no hope. For somebody that's just not listening to anybody. Like getting lifted all the time as well. Getting trouble by the police. I thought it was cool, but then it could have. Jeopardised trying to get a job now. Could have done loads of everything I'd done, could have went against, well, my life now. So I think people just kind of washed their hands and just gave up and then stuff. So I'm glad that I've grown up and seen what I was like. Krakow, at the end of the war, wasn't destroyed. It was one of the few Polish cities that actually retained its infrastructure. Its buildings are the same. They've maybe changed it a wee bit, but you know, there's more traffic on the roads. But the, the, the whole experience being in Krakow actually gives you a feel of what it might have been like at the actual time. And that was one of the reasons as well. It was about the young people, you know, came from Tayside to actually go there and see what a European city is like, where the buildings look different, they've actually got trams running through the streets, and it's a, they've got the cafe culture. Actually, just Krakow's got the big, one of the biggest Euro squares in Europe. It's actually got a medieval heritage as well. And I, I think. It was to broaden the eyes of the young people that we are actually working with to actually see there is this other world and the people that's actually coming from Poland to work here come from that background and that experience and they've got to experience our world and it's about the exchange of cultures and the exchange of beliefs and exchange uh, how they've been brought up and how they live their lives. They've opened a new museum in the old Schindler factory in the, the get, ghetto district of Krakow. And it only opened in June this year, and I'd never been there before. And it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful museum. It's, it's a really interactive museum, and you could spend hours. And they've got, it's the history of Krakow from 1939 to 1945 during the German occupation. And we went to that museum on the Tuesday afternoon before the trip to Auschwitz. And what really hit me was the young people took different things out of that. Kaya, again, who'd really enjoyed the ghetto experience and looking at how the people lived, she really took, she spent a lot of time looking at the exhibitions and she said afterwards that that was more powerful for her because it was interactive and she could actually see the people. She can actually relate to the people because she'd seen how they lived their lives in the ghetto. Then she actually went and seen and seen images and film about their experience and during that period when the, the Germans or the Nazis had actually taken over Krakow.
<laughs> on the train I was scared. I was just, I never really spoke at all. I don't think I actually said one word, probably about five words or it's about two hours. And it was just like dread. I was dreading it so much and I was thinking every time the train stopped, oh, I wish I could just get off the train, I wish I could just get off the train. But then when I got around to it, I was pretty looking forward to it. Because I thought, well, this is why we're here. Because we've been thinking, oh, we all just thought, oh, this is great, we're going shopping, we're going out for meals, we're going out, you know what I mean? And then it was like, no, this is why we're here, though. This is, we weren't coming here to just go out, eat dinner, have a good laugh. We're here to do this, so. I was just sitting there and I was thinking, why should I feel sorry for myself and dread going to this place when it's, in a way, it is quite respectful. It's, it's like paying your respect because you can't, I was like, thinking I don't want to go and I had the choice to not go. If I didn't want it, I didn't have to. But then I thought, nah, because they people never had a chance, so just go and do it. Because I know that I'm coming back from it. Like, I can go and come back. So I thought, there's no point, that's just to chicken out and I think that's pretty selfish, I think. I think it's selfish. If, if I never went, I would have kept myself out because I would feel pretty selfish and like quite I feel pretty like a bitch, I suppose. <laughs> You see a uh, murder happening on that scale, it just seems unrealistic that you refuse to believe it and then I suppose that sort of adds to how I was feeling that I wasn't really you know, like concerned about it because it just seems so unrealistic that it just isn't, isn't believable. Well, it happened to so many people that it'd be hard to have all these emotions for millions of people. So you really need to see them as a whole, one p thing. Because when there's that many people, you can't really see it as all them, it's just a thing. Uh, and like I said, that at that scale, it's unrealistic and you can't really believe it. I mean, the only way I'd be able to believe it if I was really there at that time. Most people would say it's uh, mentally depressing and uh, you know emotionally deteriorating, but you know I thought I'd just seen it as a whole educational sort of thing to learn about who, what really happened and get into the whole concept to how they left, what happened there. I think people, not everyone, some people will feel guilt because they've uh, sort of like let that this mass genocide take place and it could have been prevented really if somebody had stepped in at the right time and done something about it but they never and that's what led to the whole thing so yeah some people might feel guilt because in a way they allowed it to happen but not un un unintentionally they let it happen
Uh, the most memorable things I saw was at Auschwitz. One, where we went into the a whole room full of two tons of hair. It was just like the way it was set out, just all this hair in one. It just like, think about how much hair one person has. And then like, it practically weighs nothing. And then seeing this whole room, knowing it weighs two tons. Just can't believe how many people that would come off. You can't imagine it. And uh, another part in, in the same block, that was a part of spectacles. Our pair of shoes, children's clothes, and toothbrushes, hairbrushes, and shoe polish. Before we actually came to Poland, I was told about the part of spectacles, and I was surprised to actually see it with my own eyes. It's surprising. So that, that struck me quite a lot. bet that um, was pretty, was a slap in the face was the women's bit, where the women slept. When I went in, it was like, um, we went in and it was like, well, everyone was soaking, everyone was tired by this point, so was I. But when I went in, like it was, I don't know, I felt like someone, when I walked, there was like the beds, the were well, the crates, and there was one, when you went in the door, and you turn to your left, there was one right there, that was one separate, that was on its own there, and then there was two or three in front of it. And we were standing, like everyone was standing just at there, but I was standing next to the one on its own, and it was against the wall at the door, and it was like really dark. And I can remember just turning around and looking at it, and it felt like someone was, like, it felt like someone was in it, but looking back, right back at me. And it was making my, my hair stand up on my neck. It was, it was freaky because it felt like someone was, like, because it was really dark in that bit. And it felt like someone was just sitting, like, I really felt like someone was sitting there just watching. And it felt, I don't know, it made me freeze and just think, oh, no, I want to get out of here. And it was making, like, my heart was racing. I just wanted to get out. I didn't know what was, was freaking me out. It's quite freaky to talk about it, but it was freaked out. I didn't know what to stay there any longer. That bit was... That was the worst bit of, oh, I don't know what it was, but it was really freaky. I couldn't, it just, and like when she was on about, like the women, when they all had diary on sickness, and where would you want to sleep if you're in there, she asked us. And I was like, well, the top, because she said that the ones on the middle and the bottom, whatever was happening up on the top was all going down. You can't really imagine it in your head. You try and picture it, I try and picture it and picture it, but I can't, I can't even picture anything. I think that when we went to Birkenau, that was a bigger one. I don't know, it felt nothing again. They're just nothing, like going into the, well, they still had the original um, sleeping quarters, but the sheds where they got kept and slept, none of it, like even going in and I sat down like in the men's bit, there was like, they still had the crates where they slept and then along the middle was the heater where they like, must have cuddled, like not cuddled in it but shuddered against it when it was that cold and I was sitting on it, just sitting bored when she was talking, not bored because of what I was interested in it but it was just like, just sitting on it and it wasn't until I went out and I was thinking, I've just sat on a heater where probably thousands of people have sat against before they got killed and not cared. And that's what I was kind of a bit annoyed at myself because I didn't really think of it. And I just sat down like nothing had happened. And then when we were walking the two miles in the middle of it all, it was like, I walked on my own because I just wanted to walk on my own. And we walked away, if you got, if you were getting to the gas chamber, walked that way. And I remember like, because it was raining, I had my head down because my umbrella was broken. And I was remember looking at all the cobbles and like counting them when I was walking and thinking, 
just this is where loads of people walked and they're just waiting to die. Like this is the last place they've walked. And I was just imagining all these feet, like people walking, but like looking at all these, but they never knew. It's pretty weird when you think about it because like we knew if it was us, we knew that like, they were getting, like that's what they were doing. Ultimately, the Dev Camp so Switch and Birkenau are just museums of history, but also mass graves, and not in a metaphorical sense, in a literal sense. One of the most striking concepts about visiting the Dev Camps was the vast scale of the Dev Camps and the industrialisation of the death process. Because you see all these buildings go on and on and on and on. And it just shows the vast quantities of the prisoners that would have been kept up throughout the whole world war time. And then got killed and then replaced with more prisoners. When we're talking about prejudice, it's something that's almost inherited in many ways. You know, if you you grow up with the with the prejudices that you hear your parents express, and you know the little community that you're growing up in, you grow up um, understandably with with all of their thoughts and ideas and ideals. Well, if you're growing up with those um, those prejudices, and then you have children then chances are those children will grow up with the same prejudices as well. So I, I suppose the real importance of, of working with young people is that you hope that if you are dealing with young people who um, have experience of, of having grown up with prejudiced views or, um, a prejudice, in a prejudiced environment, no matter who that's directed at, you know, whether it's Catholic or Protestant or skin colour or gender um, or the, the place that, that, you, um, that you live in or whether you wear glasses or whether you've got red hair, any of those things. If you can actually get with a young person and get them to reflect on things, as young people tend to be, tend to be more open-minded, um, then the hope is that that's breaking that cycle of prejudice. Um, and I, I think that's uh, um, my genuine hope that, that young people will be, will, will be the ones who are going to make the difference in the future. <laughs>